I have this problem I keep running into. For example, this is an induction motor that I took out of a glass cutting machine. And I'd love to repurpose this motor for a project I've got coming up pretty soon. But I have no idea how much power this motor can produce at the shaft. In order to measure that, you need a machine called a dynamometer. You may have seen a dynamometer in the context of a race car, but they make the exact same machine for electric motors as well. Now, I did look into purchasing a dyno, but as soon as I saw how much they cost, I went right back to thinking about a DIY option. So then, how do we solve this problem? What is a dynamometer actually measuring? Uh, there are basically only two components. There's speed, that is how fast the motor is spinning, and then there's torque. You can think of torque as the twisting force being applied to the shaft. I'm gonna show you the formula for horsepower, but most other places in the world use the kilowatt to measure power. Here in the US we use horsepower, but the same way that feet and meters both are measuring distance, horsepower and kilowatts are both measuring power. In fact, the conversion is 0.746 kilowatts per horsepower. I told you earlier that there are two things we need to capture. We need to measure the RPM, that's measured by this sensor right here, and there's a magnet, which you can see glued to my coupler. As that magnet goes by, the sensor picks it up and displays the RPM over here. I also need to measure the torque, and so this was the more complicated part of this formula. The way I'm capturing that is by taking a lever, which is exactly one foot long from the center of this point here to the center of rotation, and I'm measuring the amount of force being applied to this scale. So it's pounds force times one, and that'll be displayed over here on the screen as foot pounds. But there's one more tricky component to this. If you rotate this shaft over here, it doesn't apply any torque to this motor. What I had to do was run DC current through this motor here, and it essentially turns it into an electric brake. I got this idea from Matthias. Thank you, sir, for that fantastic idea. I posted a comment on Twitter saying that I was working on this project, and he suggested I use an induction motor with DC in order to apply torque to the body of the motor. So that number is displayed here. RPM is displayed here. I've already done the math and I know that with a two horsepower motor and 1,725 RPM, we should see about six foot pounds of torque. Let's fire it up. All right, everybody's on. First, we're gonna get it up to its rated speed, which should give us very little power here. But once I start applying the braking force, we should see the torque going up on the scale. Let's apply the brakes. All right, that's where we wanna be, about six, six and a half. Almost there. Yes! That, my friends, is what I call science. Now, uh, that was a lot of fun. This is a three-phase motor. Let's switch it out to a single-phase motor while this is cooling off and also run it at 120 volts and let's see how that does. There's one more variable we need to talk about, and that's service factor. The motor that I just took off of the rig has a service factor of 1.15. That means that it can handle 115% of its rated horsepower for brief periods of time without any permanent damage to the motor. But many motors cannot go even a tiny bit over its rated horsepower for any amount of time. And that's why it's important that you test it at its rated current as I just did, and that I plan to do with this same motor. Most of the time you're gonna be testing an unknown motor, but almost always there's a little label or something, like if you look at the uh, unknown motor we were talking about before, it's got a rated current of 1.45 at 115 volts. So now I know how much power I should be drawing from the wall when the motor is putting out its rated horsepower. Well, we've switched gears and now we're testing the other extremes of this rig. I'm gonna be putting a lot more force on the scale. This is a geared motor, even though it's smaller. At 18 to one, it's gonna produce a lot more torque. As you can see, the label says it's 0.2 kilowatts. So we're gonna be measuring that here with the rig. Let's fire it up. I've got a switch somewhere. Oh, there it is. I'm feeling nothing here, by the way, which is normal. 
All right, let's apply the brakes. Woo! <laughs> well, that was an interesting result there. Uh, one of the things I wanted to be able to test was whether you could 3D print these couplers instead of buying them over and over again. So I took this coupler, I modeled it up, and 3D printed them. This is PETG plastic, which is supposed to be pretty good for um, you know mechanical type applications, and you can still print it on most 3D printers. I, I understand that you can get way more exotic plastics that can be 3D printed. So we're gonna go ahead and switch back to the metal couplers so that we can finish this test. So while I'm taking this apart, I guess I could be talking about the 3D printed coupler. My intent was to see if I could 3D print these guys and even uh, cut threads in them. Now, this wasn't; these are not printed threads. Basically, I printed it with a hole the size that you would normally drill for the thread and then actually tapped the hole with a regular tap in order to put these little set screws in there. And that actually seemed to work out pretty good. But again, this is a very high torque motor and so it just could not handle, it could not handle the force that was being applied. So there you go, uh, PETG, print it solid. One other thing I've done here is created a recess pocket for the magnet, but in the center of that is another tapped hole. And the same way that I tapped these holes, I tapped that hole. So there's epoxy in the bottom, as well as the screw threaded in to hold it into place. Now that seems like overkill at 90 RPM, but through testing with some universal motors and um, playing around, I realized that once you get to about 18,000, 20,000 RPM, which I do plan to test that, you essentially sling this magnet out if it's only epoxied in. So the combination of the thread and the epoxy was what it takes to hold it because of the centrifugal force at those high speeds. At lower speeds, it doesn't matter very much. You can probably just glue it in. Okay, I think we're ready to try this again. So motors all set back up. Power it up, just in case little pieces come flying off. Let's supply some braking power. All right, so we're already approaching the rated voltage, or sorry, rated current, 1.5. All right, so I'm gonna call that rated current at 2.6 and 9.6 pounds. All right, let's see if we can go any higher. Oh, it's taking a lot more power now to go up. 12.1, it's gonna get much more. Yeah, oh. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know what just happened there. Suddenly the torque was gone. Oh, I wonder if this motor has a clutch. That would be pretty sweet. That makes me wanna take it apart. All right, we're gonna try this one more time. Okay, after some troubleshooting, I now realize that the problem is in my test rig and not in the test motor. I'm not gonna be able to push enough power through this system in order to get 14 foot pounds of torque. This display here is limited to 20 amps. This motor here is normally on design for about three amps at 200 or so volts. And my DC power supply seems to be stopping around 17, 18 amps, despite me turning the dial all the way up. Remember, that's actually a speed controller and not a true DC power supply, so I can't control the voltage and current separately. Um, with those limitations, I've actually probably saved my test rig by not being able to go any higher anyway. I may have damaged the wiring inside of this motor. What that means for me is that I'm gonna be limited to about 12 foot-pounds of torque with this particular setup, and that's perfectly fine. Most of the motors I'm gonna be testing that don't already have a label on it are probably gonna be putting out three foot pounds or less anyway. So I am super stoked about our rig. One other thing I noticed during the test was there was this sort of grinding sound as the torque was going up. That turned out to be this thrust bearing that I have here in the back. I took it out and wiped it out. It had a little bit of crud or dirt or something in it and it quieted right down. So that's what that noise was. All of my follow-up tests had the same torque though, so I don't think it had any effect on the results. Now let's talk about how you're gonna make your own. This frame was designed in SOLIDWORKS and I'll make the 3D model available for you so that if you go down to the description and click on the link, you'll be able to download the 3D model and a wiring diagram for this guy over here. I knew I wanted to use this particular one horsepower motor as my braking motor. And so most of the heights and the lever arm here and everything that you see was designed around that. 
If you're gonna be using a different motor, of course, you're gonna to need to redesign this bracket. And ideally, it would be a C-face motor like this. Although that doesn't mean that you couldn't take something that will be mounted to the feet, because every motor will have feet on it, and do something similar. There are a couple more variables you need to consider about the particular motor that you're gonna be using. Number one, ideally it would be a dual shaft motor like this guy. This technically is not a dual shaft motor. What I have here on the back, it's actually a little stub of the shaft that the fan was attached to. I ripped the fan off and I'm using that as my uh, shaft sticking out of the back. The downside to that is now you don't have any external cooling for this motor. A couple options might be to just set a fan uh, here on the side, which I didn't do in this case. And this motor did get a little warm earlier with the testing of this motor. You can just let it cool. You're only gonna be testing one motor at a time, I hope. Now, I was very careful to design this to be exactly one foot long so that the numbers on the scale would also correspond with the torque values. But uh, there's no reason that you can't just do the math and calculate this and make it any length that you want. For example, if you wanted this design to be metric, you probably wouldn't make a meter long lever, what you do is do a half a meter or something that's more practical for this type of design. Another thing to consider is the bearings inside of the motor that you're using. Uh, I looked up the bearings that came with this particular motor and they were rated for, I think about 5,000 RPM, which is pretty good considering the fact that this motor only runs at 1,700 RPM and there's no reason to expect it to go higher than that. So I replaced the bearings on the inside of this motor with bearings that were rated for 20,000 RPM because I wanna be able to put universal motors on this rig and they run significantly faster. And the same thing with the uh, support pillars here on the outside, uh, those are needle bearings which are rated for 30,000 RPM for the same reason. I wanted something that could handle the high speeds. One thing to consider with this particular setup is that the alignment between the motors needs to be pretty good and as the torque and speed go up, the precision of the alignment between the shafts, both vertically and horizontally, becomes more and more important. One more alternative would be to go to a tooth belt. And under those circumstances, it's basically like a gear drive system. You're gonna have uh, pulleys with teeth as well as uh, a tooth belt. But beyond that, you, you'll have a system that will allow you to transfer pretty much all of the power any loss after that would be from the belt vibrating and things like that, which would be negligible under these circumstances. There are a few other parts that you'll need. For example, this uh, Hall Effect sensor here with the display. Uh, I'll put a link to that guy in the description. It's literally just plug and play with 12 volts. Next, we have our load cell, and I purchased this guy on Amazon. I'll put a link in the description. This is actually for weighing mail. I picked this particular model because it went to pounds to three decimal places. But once I got it, I didn't want the display to be here. I wanted the display to be over here. So basically what I did is I cut off the front, I cut the wires and then extended them all so that I could mount the display in this case and have all of my variables displayed inside of one panel. Certainly you're gonna need some kind of DC power supply. Right now I'm using a shop made DC power supply and there's a video in the description which shows you how I made that. That's made with a few cheap components from Amazon and treadmill components. But you could also use, you know, bench top power supply like this guy. Um, maybe I'll put a link to this in the description as well if you just wanna buy something off the shelf. The reason I'm not using that one is because it only goes up to 30 volts. And as you can see with this motor, I needed just a little bit more DC power than that. But again, if you're testing much smaller motors, you don't need something that can put out 120 volts DC like my setup over here. The other thing I like about the, what I'm calling the store-bought power supply, adjustable power supply, is that you can fine tune the current and voltage a lot more precisely than I can with this setup. So keep that in mind. One amazing upgrade I think to this system would be to take a load cell, um, Hall effect sensor, have all this data fed into say an Arduino, display it on one screen, and then maybe capture it on a spreadsheet, or even just a text file that was capturing real-time speed and loads. Imagine that, you could plot speed versus torque, you could show a lot of these things on a scale, and you'd be essentially operating at the level of a professional dynamometer. So I'm really excited about the potential of this idea. I don't have the Arduino skills to do that just yet. What might be a cool side project is if 
one of you Arduino experts could help me write the code on that. And then I could come back and add that to this project so that other people could incorporate that in their dynamometers. Well, I think I covered all the major components. If you really want to copy me though, you're going to download the files and stuff anyway. So there's more information there. My whole goal in showing you this was just to empower you guys to be able to do this stuff at home. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to test your motors and reuse some of that stuff that you was thinking about throwing away. You got any questions for me? Post them in the comments, let me know. I'll try to answer as many as I can, but there are like hundreds of thousands of you <laughs> and only one of me, so I'm not gonna be able to answer everyone. And if I made any mistakes in this video, then I will add notes to the description, like little corrections. So be sure to check that out as well. Anyway, thanks for watching.